Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at the South Seaville United Methodist Church. We have services here every Sunday morning at 8.30 in the morning and 10.30 uh, on Sundays. Uh, we're currently wearing masks and physically distancing, uh, but again, it's been good to see folks coming back out again uh, as they've received the vaccine and feeling uh, much uh, safer in these days. It's always good to spend time in fellowship with one another, and that's what we provide here uh, as we worship the Lord together. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, I want to thank again those who volunteer at our community thrift. Uh, last Friday completed six years of ministry uh, within this community, touching so many lives here locally uh, and around the world through uh, their giving through missions. Just again, a word of thank you for all that volunteer. Tomorrow night on Monday, April 26th, there will be an administrative board meeting here at the church. It'll be in the sanctuary. And again, those leaders need to be here. Uh, that'll be at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. Today, we're going to continue to look and to think about the character of God. There are certain attributes, aspects of God's character that are unique only to God. And there are others that God possesses that you and I too can possess. The implication of which we'll see have a profound effect on my relationship, your relationship to God and with one another. I invite you to bow with me in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you again for the opportunity to meet and to worship, to listen, to learn, to grow in this way. We thank you, God, for technology. We thank you, God, for the opportunity, uh, though we may not be able to get out, that we can watch this, God, whenever we want. We give you thanks for that. We thank you, God, for who you are, a God that is compassionate, a God that doesn't leave us alone, but is engaged with us. We thank you, God, for our families and for our friends. As we move through these days, we thank you, God, again for uh, scientists and inventions and the creative minds that you've given to learn things, to create things. We ask God you might continue to be with those who are struggling in these days, whether they be struggling with anxiety or worry, whether, God, they be struggling with financial difficulty, whether, God, it be relational struggles, whether there be struggles at work or the lack thereof, God, just continue to have people reach out to you. May your spirit minister to hearts in these days. May people not be depressed, may they not be discouraged, but may they find encouragement and strength in you. We thank you, God, for our children. We thank you for the education that they're getting for uh, this interesting year of learning online, God, and now an opportunity again for our children here uh, to be back in school five days a week, God. We thank you for the hard work that was done to make that happen and, and continues to be done by our teachers and administrators. Thank you, God, for parents and for families. Continue to bless our children through these days. May they be encouraged. May they not find themselves depressed or lonely or filled with anxiety. But again, God, may they find direction and purpose and meaning in life. May they find contentment, contentment, God, in the things that they're doing, in the places they're going, the things that are next, God, on the horizon in their lives. We thank you, God, again, as we've said, for our families, for our, our wives and our husbands, for our parents, our grandparents. You have blessed us, God, with so much. Continue to guide us in these days. Continue to use us. We're grateful, God, for this local congregation, for the, the people here that serve so faithfully, whether it be through uh, the school or through the food pantry or through our community thrift, God, or other ways in which we're able to serve and to help others. We give you thanks and we give you praise. For you've given us a message of hope and of help through Jesus, the word becoming flesh as we've been thinking, dwelling among us. Uh, Lord God, Jesus living upon this earth, teaching us. Jesus being here and sacrificing his life that we might have everlasting life, that we could be forgiven of our sins. God, may all those things never be commonplace, but may they be meaningful and applicable and touch truly the depth of our hearts and our souls. May we realize, God, that we are spiritual beings. May we realize, God, that your spirit blesses us and helps us in these days. That as we've said many times, you don't leave us 
helpless or hopeless, but you give us the strength we need even in our weaknesses. Lord God, be with our nation, be with our world, be with all that's happening. Continue to give us wisdom and discernment as we see things around us. Continue, God, to help us direct conversations into spiritual matters. Continue, God, to help us point people towards you. Now, Lord God, draw us together even now over this technology as we unite together in the prayer that you taught your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Would you bow again with me in a word prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Last week we said that our purpose in life is to know and glorify God and to help other people know and glorify God. We said that God is our focus. It's all about God. It's all about God. It's not about me. See, we're trying to understand and know who God is. Even though there are some things we can never fully understand, that we say it's a mystery, but we continue to try to figure out, we continue to try to learn who God is. And God has sought to reveal himself to us. Even though he's too great for our finite minds, we said to understand, but God has defined himself. Only God can define who God is. And, and the source from which we learn who God is, is the Bible. Last week we talked about the three persons of God. We worship one God, but God has chosen to reveal himself, to relate to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We said that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature, the exact representation of God's being. When we see Jesus, we see God. We said that deep, deep thought that how God interrelates with himself is an illustration and model of how we can and should and need to relate to God and each other. How God interrelates with himself is an illustration and model of how we need to and can relate to God and each other. That the Godhead teaches us how to truly be in relationship with one another. And what is it we learn from the Godhead? What do we learn how, about how God relates within God's self, oneself? No part of God is self-edifying. That teaches us what relationships are all about. We, we need to care more about others than ourselves. No part of God draws attention to itself but points to the other. God cares more about us than himself. That's why Jesus was sent. Jesus is that massive, clear illustration that God cares more about us than himself. And in turn, God wants us to care more about others than ourselves. We even talked last week about the word person, that the, the word itself had, had its origin in, in, as a theological term. It was created by Christians, Christians who th sought to define Christian theological concepts, that you are a person, that God is three persons. It's amazing that you and I can know and love the person of God, that human beings can know and love a person. Now, I want us to keep moving forward today and, and, and look at, at some of the qualities, some of the attributes, some of the aspects of God's character, the divine attributes of God, those qualities that define the character of God. You will find many people that will tell you they don't believe in God. You ever had a conversation with someone that, that, that says that to you? I don't believe in God. Well, as you talk to them, you should ask them what God they believe in. Because if they are 
thinking about a God that they have made up or that they've heard, you probably would say you don't believe in that God either. See, the words we use have meaning, and oftentimes we need to make sure we clarify what those words mean to the people we're talking to, how they're hearing those words. Sometimes a word we use has a meaning that we understand, but someone else may not have the same understanding and meaning of that word. It's always good to ask, what does that mean to you? How do you understand who God is? There's some attributes of God that are beyond our limited mind to comprehend. Some attributes that are too wonderful for words. These characteristics that God possesses that you and I will never completely understand. They're attributes that only God has. But there are some attributes we'll look at today that we share with God. Part of the image in which we've been created of, with God. Attributes that God has that I believe he wants us to have as well. Now the big term... The big term that we can never obtain certain attributes of God is incommunicable. Incommunicable. These are the incommunicable attributes of God. They're unique to God. We can never have them. They're not able to be communicable, able to be communicated. Everything we say today, again, you need to think about. That's why we have notes. So let's first look at some of those attributes that are hard for us to understand and that are unique only to God. The first one is this. God is not limited by creation. God simply was and is. He is uncreated. In Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25, it says this. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. See, God is not bound by a physical body. Pe people often want to, to know, uh, try, try knowing God, make God uh, a certain gender, male or female. God is a spirit. John said that. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So first, God is not limited by creation. Second, God is not limited by space. So we hear words like he's omnipresent or imminent. God is everywhere and, and available. Solomon, after he built this very impressive temple, said this. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you, he said. How much less this temple? that I've built. One of the followers of John Wesley, H. Orton Wiley, said, God exists in immensity and infinitude. That's, that's how you can say that. Immensity and infinitude. Something to think about. Not that God is everything he has made, but that God is always present in every part of God's creation. God is not limited by space. God is not limited by time. God is eternal. God is the Alpha and Omega. He was and, and is to come. God stands above time. There, there's not one to follow after him. There's not one that came before him. He has no beginning. He has no end. No past, no future. He is eternally now. I remember a time when I was substituting at a Christian school, 7th grade history class, talking about creation. I asked them, we know what time it is. We look at our phones and our watches and the clocks on the wall, but what time is it to God right now? Kind of makes my brain kind of go. If God is everywhere all the time, then God is in this moment. God created time. For us, time is a measurable force, but, but not to God. God is from everlasting to everlasting. God is not limited by time. Nor is God limited by change. That's the word immutable. Big word, immutable. God is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and forever. God says, I, the Lord, do not change. The earth will perish. Everything you see around you, church, home, possessions, all of the works will vanish, but God remains the same. 
The Hebrew writer said this, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll up, you will roll them up like a, a robe, like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. James said, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God does not change. Nor is God limited by ignorance. God's omniscient. He's all-knowing. God possesses perfect knowledge of everything. Again, in the scripture, nothing in all creation, it says, is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Even Isaiah 46, 10 says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. He has perfect knowledge. He's the only wise God. Even when our finite minds reject his will, he knows of an advance and plans accordingly. Paul told the Romans, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. God is not limited by ignorance. And if all those were enough, it's not enough, there's, there's one more. God is not limited by any weakness. He's om omnipotent, another big word, all-powerful. The Lord God, we say, almighty. We have songs about it. We sing about the mightiness of God. A mighty fortress is our God. Jeremiah said it, O sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Again, Isaiah said in, in chapter 40, verse 21, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. Jesus, knowing God's power, said this to his disciples, with all things, all things are possible with God. God is sovereign. He is all powerful. Our Lord God Almighty reigns, it says. God is not limited by any weakness. We serve, friends, we serve a mighty, mighty God. Amen? When that reality hits, that, you know, God is, God is awesome. It's, it's awesome and amazing to begin to think about the, the magnitude, the massiveness, the, the awesomeness of God, his attributes, his character that we can never possess, but God possesses. Those things that make God, God. But now let's think for a few moments about those attributes, those qualities that God possesses that you and I can possess as well. Those things we share with God as God enables us and God empowers us. That God has and that, God, that, God, uh, that, that we can have as well. They're not incommunicable, but they are, again, the big word, communicable moral attributes. Those things of God that you and I also possess. Number one, God is just. It is impossible for God to be unjust. God is righteous, it says, in all his ways. The psalmist also said, righteousness and judgment are the foundation of his throne. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. That's the foundation of God's law. God cannot be compromised. Judgment is always a reflection of his justice. Abraham said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? The answer, of course, is yes. God is just. And listen, 
God wants you and I to also be just. We can be just. Another communicable attribute of God is God is faithful. God cannot deceive or be unfaithful. The Hebrew writer said it's impossible for God to lie. God's word is truth. So we can trust what God says. What God promised, God will do. In Numbers it says, God is not man that he should lie, nor son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? See, God is faithful. And God wants us, you and I, to be faithful. Third communicable attribute, God is sinless. God cannot be defiled or contaminated by sin. God is holy. God is utterly separate from anything wicked. Habakkuk 113 says, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. So we understand when Jesus hung on the cross and he looked upon himself, he, he there took all those sins of the world upon himself. All the past, present, future sins of all time. The, the sky turned dark. And God could not look at his very own son because his son Jesus took all eternity's sin upon himself. Holiness defines the nature of God. One of my favorite passages of scripture is in, in Isaiah. Isaiah shares a vision he had of, of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. He says, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. We're told that when God is seated on his throne, the, the angels, the, the seraphim in his very presence are calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled. What amazing, amazing glory of God. So they, they couldn't even look at it. They had to cover their faces with, with their wings and their feet. See, it is a humble thing to come into the presence of a holy God. And it's said three times, holy, holy, holy. This great exclamation point of God's key character. Listen, while God is set apart from everyone and everything else, he wants us, his creation. This, this thought, he wants us to, to be like him. That we've been created in his image. I mean, what does it mean that we're in the image of God? We've been created in his image to be like him. And it may seem frustration. It may even seem an impossibility for some. Yet as followers of Jesus Christ, we're told that you and I too are to be holy because I am holy. That's what Jesus said. Be holy because I am holy. Because I am holy, you can be holy. This characteristic makes you and I different than the world around us. You will be for me, it says in Exodus, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And, and by the way, that's why you're listening today. That's why people gather for worship. That's why we have a church to help people be holy. It's another part of God's plan for our lives. We're to know God and we're to glorify God. And a result of knowing God and glorifying God, we will be holy ourselves and helping other people know and glorify God. And in turn, they themselves too will be holy. God is sinless. And he wants us, you and I, and has made it possible for you and I to be forgiven of our sin. That's why Jesus died that we can be forgiven of our sin, that sin won't have a hold on us, that we can be holy. And these are not things I believe we need to wait for till we get to heaven, but we can experience now. I want you to think about the implication of that. God is holy. Another quality of God, characteristic, 
God is love. God cannot be unloving. God is. See, remember we said it's, it's all about God and it's not about me. God is love. The psalmist said, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is seen again in the relationship that God shares within the Godhead, within himself. Each part of God cares more about the other than itself. God cares more about you and I than himself. And the death of Jesus, this divine act of love for us, illustrates God, God's love that was initiated that we might be brought back into a relationship with God. We call that our salvation, that we can be forgiven of our sins, that our relationship with God can be reconciled, it can be redeemed. Not that we loved God, John said, but that God loved us. Again, God is love. While we were still disobedient, while we were still wandering in darkness, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for you and for me. It was a demonstration. It was an illustration of God's love. God is love, and God wants you and I to be loving toward him and others. So what's the application? With all these attributes, the things that God possesses and I can never possess, and the things that we think about that God does possess and wants me to possess. Again, being a Christian, a follower, is not just taking a pill and everything changes and, and all of a sudden you understand everything. It takes time. It takes thinking. It takes reflection. So I want to encourage you to take some time this week and think about the implication for your life. To take this handout, to take some time and reflect on each one of these ideas. What's the implication for your life uh, in regard to who God is? Who do you see God to be? What does the Bible tell us who God is? What does it mean? All these things of God's character about my, my own relationship with God. What does it mean about God's relationship with me? What does it mean about God's relationship with you? What does it mean about God's relationship with others? What does it mean about my relationship with others? You see, it's no surprise that God wants us to love like Jesus loved. God wants us to care about others the way that Jesus cared for others. When we love like that, it shows us, it reminds us, and it reminds and lets others see that we are following Jesus. John 14, 23, Jesus said this, If anyone loves me, who will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. In the same way that God loved us when we did not know he was loving us, in the same way that God loved us when we were sinning in disobedience, when we were misbehaving and God still loved us, we ought to love God. Others. This is so relevant for our days today. Even though other people may not understand it, even though other people might be in the midst of sin, even though other people might disagree with what we believe, even though people might argue with us about things, we, you and I, are still called to love one another. What does the Bible say? What, is, what does Jesus say? You've heard that it was said, love your enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Love one another. Love those who are in the body of Christ. Love those who are not yet in the body of Christ. Love those who believe the way you believe. Love those who have not yet or may totally disagree with what you believe. We're to love one another. Who is it you're loving today that has been persecuting you? Who is it that you love? I'm going to ask you to bow with me in prayer. Lord God, help us to think, help us to reflect upon your divine character. 
these attributes, these things, God, that we can never fully understand and experience, but again are revealed in your word that, that you're not limited by creation or by space or by time or by change or by ignorance or by weakness. That we might understand, God, those mysterious things that make you God. But may we also see, God, those things that we've been created in your image that you want us to possess as well. That you want us to be just like you. You want us to be just and faithful, sinless, and holy. May we see, God, that Jesus died not only to forgive us of our sin, but that we might be reconciled in our relationship with you. And that we might continue, not waiting till we get to heaven, not waiting till these physical bodies wither up and die, but God, because of your Holy Spirit, your presence, you can give us the strength now to do the right things and not the wrong things. So help us. Enable us, God, to not sin, to be holy. God, help us to truly love others, even those who sin against us, even those who believe differently than we do, even those who like to argue with us. We have to help us to love them. We pray all this in the name of Christ and all God's people said, Amen and Amen. And now, friends, go forth. Go forth from this place, loving God and truly desiring, seeking, doing all you can to love one another. Go forth now in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.